Have you considered the role of hepcidin in regulating your low iron levels? Hepcidin is the master iron regulating hormone. Stay tuned to learn more. You're listening to Menopause Natural Solutions. This is episode 190, Optimizing Low Iron Levels. Welcome to Menopause Natural Solutions, your podcast for all things perimenopause, menopause and beyond. Stay tuned as your host, naturopath Jennifer Harrington, explains how to use natural therapies to find your ultimate health and happiness during your transition. Hi, it's Jen. Today I want to talk about a theme that kept coming up in my clinic in January. You see, themes often run through life and they certainly run through my clinic. One month everyone will be asking about headaches. The next everyone will have joint pain and so on. January for me was all about iron. Most women had low iron issues, but a few had high. As the vast majority of last month's discovery calls were focused on low iron, I thought I would go back and cover iron again today. If you are wondering what discovery calls are, they are your chance to chat with me personally. I offer a complimentary 15-minute mini consultation to women who are interested in working with me. This is your time to talk about your health concerns and your health goals to see if we are a right fit to continue working together. I'll leave a link in the show notes in case you'd like to chat with me. I'm not surprised by the high number of calls focused on iron as I have personally struggled with anemia caused by my dysfunctional uterine bleeding. I won't cover my story today, but if you haven't heard it, head back to episode 179, Iron Deficiency Anemia in Perimenopause. Actually, it's worth going back to hear a few basics about iron as I'm not covering them today. Today I want to discuss things I didn't touch on in episode 179, starting with hepcidin. Hepcidin is the master iron regulating hormone produced from the liver. Hepcidin binds to and blocks ferroportin, an iron export protein, blocking it from iron and preventing its absorption. In simpler terms, it changes the amount of available iron receptors in the small intestines that are able to absorb iron. Hepcidin rises in response to non heme or plant-based iron sources and supplementation. This elevation may last for over 24 hours. Due to this, it's worth considering alternative day supplementation in order for your supplements to move through the small intestine when your iron receptors aren't blocked and they are available to uptake iron. Keep in mind, heme forms of iron, such as red meat and beef liver, aren't thought to produce the same effects and may be a better option. Hepcidin is also elevated in response to the presence of inflammation. The stimuli for this elevation is through inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin-6. The key here is to reduce the inflammation prior to supplementing with iron as increased intestinal iron isn't able to be absorbed and also produces further inflammation, creating a worse outcome. Infections also increase hepcidin, but this is a protective mechanism, as many infections use iron as fuel. So if you can limit the amount of iron being absorbed, we limit the amount of fuel we provide to the infections, and you can hopefully heal faster. This is a major issue with chronic infections. If you can't figure out why you're not absorbing iron, it's worth considering an infection. On the other hand, if an infection has limited your iron absorption and you have an iron infusion to counter the deficiency, you may make the infection worse. Another issue with high hepcidin is the prevention of iron recycling. As our red blood cells age, they get broken down and the iron component gets sent off to be recycled. This process provides over 80% of your iron requirements. To put this into perspective, less than 20% 
of your iron requirements are met from your dietary or supplemental intake. Wouldn't it make more sense to consider what other factors are needed to assist in this iron recycling process? If you have listened to episode 179, you would have heard the importance of nutritional cofactors. And the one that is essential for the recycling of iron is copper. Copper is needed for iron absorption, transportation, hemoglobin production, iron recycling, and antioxidant protection. That being said, please don't go off and buy a copper supplement. I'm suggesting you test and find out if a copper deficiency is a part of your problem. Some finer points about hepcidin is that it has a diurnal rhythm with its lowest point in the early morning and at night and highest during the day, meaning if you are supplement and want a greater chance of absorption, taking your product in the early morning on an empty stomach if you can tolerate it, as non-heme iron, and most supplements are non-heme iron, battle with other minerals for absorption and can be bound to food-based anti-nutrients such as tannins and phytates, preventing them from reaching their receptors. I've met so many women in my career who have been taking iron long-term and are still anemic, or have had multiple iron infusions and nothing much has changed. There are reasons why this could be happening. Continuing this pattern may only make the problem worse. It's time to stop and think about why. Hopefully I've given you a few suggestions to consider why your iron levels aren't optimal. But before I sign off, I want to give you a few good reasons to stop adding more iron into your body if your body isn't utilising it. One is that too much iron, too much free iron in the digestive system leads to iron overload within the mucosal cells. And this damages intestinal tissues and can lead to further digestive complications like dysbiosis, increased intestinal permeability, and inflammatory bowel disease. In regards to excess iron infusions, the extra iron in the blood may produce reactive oxygen species, potentially causing free radical damage, mitochondrial damage cellular damage with excess potentially being stored and causing organ damage. I've had two iron infusions myself. They can be life-saving, so please don't think I'm anti-infusion. Infusions should be used if needed, but if they don't change the needle, stop if you, as you have missed something. You won't know what you have missed if you don't thoroughly test. For additional testing, I really like to do a stool microbiome test. This looks for dysbiosis, hidden infections like H. pylori, digestive inflammation, intestinal bleeding and more. I find it so interesting to see the research looking at prebiotics, helping to increase iron absorption, reduce hepcidin and decrease intestinal inflammation. I can't emphasize how important it is to investigate your digestive health with low iron levels. I also look at blood tests. I like to see a full iron panel, full blood count, inflammatory markers like CRP and ESR, copper, zinc, folate, vitamin B12 and vitamin D. Something I forgot to mention is that vitamin D can help regulate hepcidin levels. So you want to make sure you have optimal vitamin D levels. That's it for me this week. I hope you've learned something new. I hope to catch you again next week. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to Menopause Natural Solutions. This podcast contains general information about menopause. It is provided as a guide and it is not intended to replace medical advice. Opinions of guests are their own and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. If you have enjoyed today's episode, please share it with a friend.